Can't sleep? Don't want to sleep? Afraid to sleep? Are the windows closed? Are your doors locked? Did you check your closet? And under your bed? Maybe you should keep a light on in the hallway, just in case. Now settle in. Make yourself comfortable. Lay back. Close your eyes. And let me tell you a story. We live in our homes and try to seal out the rest of the world. The heat, the cold, the rain. We also strive to keep out other aspects of nature we deem undesirable. The pests, bugs, and other vermin, like mice. On their own, they're actually kind of cute. But that doesn't mean you want to share your house with them. We trap and exterminate them without a second thought. But maybe we should take a moment and consider the consequences. Mouse trap. The small gray rodent scurried across the kitchen counter. Muriel screamed, Jason, Jason, get in here right now. The mouse squeezed behind the toaster just before Jason came running into the room. What is it? There's a mouse, Muriel exclaimed. Where? he asked. Behind the toaster, she replied, pointing with a shaky finger. Jason tentatively approached the shiny stainless steel appliance, reaching toward it with both hands and grabbing it firmly before pulling it away. The mouse was gone. But in the corner, just above the ridge of formica that served as a meager backsplash, there was a small hole gnawed into the drywall. It's gone, Jason reported. I can see that, Muriel said. I read somewhere that if you can see one, there are a hundred that you can't. I think that's cockroaches. I think it doesn't matter. We have mice. Well, it is getting colder. Only makes sense that they might try to get inside, Jason said. What, are you on their side? Muriel asked. There aren't any sides. They're just mice doing what mice do. Not in my house, Muriel declared. Jason nodded. It was a reasonable position. They weren't by any stretch well off, but Muriel was proud of her home, and she kept it pristine. I'll set a trap, he promised. And patch that hole. Well, if I patch it, the mouse won't be able to get to the trap. I'll patch it once we catch it. Jason wasn't the smartest man, Muriel knew, but he had a knack for thinking things through. All right, but I'm not cooking in this kitchen until it's caught. Go get some fried chicken if you want dinner. I'll pick some up on my way back from the hardware store, he promised. The next morning, the trap was sprung, and the ball of peanut butter Jason had used to bait it was missing. He and Muriel stared at the trap absent the mouse. Smart little guy, Jason remarked. Maybe you didn't do it right, Muriel suggested. Well, there aren't too many ways to set a mouse trap, and it's pretty obvious when you get it wrong, he replied, eyeing the red line on his finger that marked the proof of what he said. I can get those sticky traps. Oh, goodness, no. The poor thing would be alive for days, stuck to that awful glue. I couldn't bear it. But you're okay snapping its neck. At least it's quick, Muriel explained. Poison? Jason asked. Lord, no. I can just imagine their little corpses rotting away inside the walls. Maybe we should call a professional. We can't afford an exterminator. Jerry's brother works for a guy. Maybe he could cut us a deal. Larry? No, Barry, the smart one. Muriel nodded. All right, give him a call. Barry Smalls inspected the hole in the wall behind the toaster. He spotted a small black dropping, removed a pair of tweezers from his tool belt, picked up the rodent excrement, and gently sniffed it. Mus musculus, he pronounced. Your common house mouse. Yes, we know that, Jason said. Barry touched the tiny fecal nugget to the tip of his tongue. It's been eating rice, he said. He sniffed again. Long grain, wild rice. Where do you keep your dry goods? He asked Muriel. In the pantry, she said, 
leading him to a narrow door off the kitchen that led to a tiny closet. He pulled on the string hanging down from the ceiling fixture that turned on the light. Barry sniffed. He searched the shelves until he came upon a bag of long grain wild rice. It's supposed to be healthier for you, Muriel explained. Barry took the bag off the shelf and a stream of grains began leaking out a hole chewed into the back of it. Oh my, Muriel said. This is a class A infestation, Barry informed her. You can't knock these little critters back with spring traps and Tupperware. What do you recommend? Jason asked. Barry scanned the walls as if he had X-ray vision, tracing an unseen route with some extrasensory instinct. They're definitely in the walls. Probably have a network of tunnels and nests. The only surefire way to get rid of them is to burn the place to the ground and start over. Let's say we're not willing to go that far, Jason said. Barry shrugged. Limit your options a bit, but I think I can get the job done. But it's not going to be cheap. How much? Muriel asked. I could probably maybe do it for thirty or forty. Dollars? Jason asked. Yeah, Barry confirmed. Larry said you're not an actual exterminator. You're just an assistant. Apprentice. I have all the skills and knowledge of a full-on exterminator, just not the shiny diploma. Are diplomas shiny? Muriel asked. Do you want the job done or not? Barry asked. I think we can manage thirty dollars if you guarantee you'll get rid of them, Jason proposed. You give me a flashlight, a wire coat hanger, a live 220 electrical line, a bottle of vinegar, a ham sandwich, and I'll get her done. What's the ham sandwich for? Muriel asked. As for me, I'm awful hungry. Muriel made Barry a sandwich as the apprentice exterminator hauled a variety of equipment out of his van. He donned a white hazmat suit and loaded a canvas bag with various tools and gear. Is all that really necessary? Jason asked. I'm not taking any chances, Barry replied. These might be mice from that lab down the road. Quantum Pharmaceutical? Yeah, that's the place. I hear they do all sorts of weird experiments there. I wouldn't put it past them to have developed some sort of super mice, and some of them got out. I work there, Jason said. I haven't heard nothing about no super mice. Of course not. You think they're going to admit they created mutant rodents that have infiltrated the local ecosystem? I saw the mouse, Barry. It looked like an ordinary little gray one to me, Muriel said. Well, that's why you hired an expert, Barry replied. How do I get to the basement? Right this way. Jason led the enthusiastic vermin eradicator to the stairway that led to the unfinished basement. It was mostly empty. Muriel wasn't much for clutter. There were some well-organized bins containing holiday decorations, and in one corner was Jason's workshop, which comprised a workbench and a few tools he used for his tinkering, as Muriel called it. Barry pulled out a flashlight and started shining it into the exposed joists in the ceiling. Aside from cobwebs and conduits, there's nothing much to see. Well, they're not coming up through the floor, Barry said. We know that, Jason replied. We found the hole in the wall. Really? Then if you're such a know-it-all, why did you call me? Are you an apprentice exterminator? Can you identify the species and sex of a rodent from a single hair? Barry stared at Jason down. Jason turned away, embarrassed. I didn't think so, Barry chided, then continued his inspection. The flashlight beam illuminated every corner, every crevice, every joint, seam, and junction. At one point, Barry scraped up a minute quantity of dust into a small glass vial. He added a clear liquid to the sample shook the tube, and it turned slightly purple. The infestation investigator nodded knowingly, then carefully filed the vial into a leather case with foam cutouts. What's that? Jason asked. Mouse dandruff. You only see that with mice that live predominantly indoors. Means there's a nest somewhere inside the house. Jason shuddered at the idea. Then he looked up the stairs to the door that was open to the kitchen hoping Muriel hadn't heard Barry's conclusion. The question is, where are they getting in? Barry asked, as he swept a cone of light across the contents of the basement. The beam settled on the old chest freezer against one wall. Did you guys buy that? No, it came with the house, Jason answered. Have you ever moved it? Nope. 
Barry approached the freezer, focusing the flashlight on the ground in front of it. He kneeled down and inspected what looked like shallow parallel grooves scratched into the surface of the concrete floor, jutting out from the freezer near the edges. Looks like someone has moved it, and fairly recently. Jason shook his head. Well, isn't us. We just keep the stuff Muriel buys at Costco when it's on sale in there. Barry glared at Jason for questioning his assessment. I'm thinking we should take a look and see what's behind it. He got to his feet and tried to pull the freezer away from the wall. The immense appliance didn't budge. A little help? Barry asked. Jason lent his efforts to pulling the weighty icebox away, and they managed to create a space between the large white container and the unfinished basement wall. Barry shined his light behind it and whistled. Whew, will you look at that? He exclaimed excitedly. Do you see something? Jason asked. Barry directed the light at Jason's eyes, forcing him to squeeze them shut while he tried to block the blinding beam with his arm. Take a look for yourself. The peevish pest controller redirected the light behind the freezer, and Jason bent over to see what had gotten Barry so excited. In the wall was a large hole near the floor, big enough to fit a man. What's that? Jason asked. A hole, Barry answered. I can see that, but what's it for? I have no idea, the excited extirpator replied. Help me move this some more. Now that the two men could get behind the freezer and push, it was easier to move it further from the wall. It made a loud, scraping sound. Barry kneeled down and shined his flashlight into the hole. What do you see? Jason asked impatiently. Looks like a tunnel. A tunnel? Yeah. Where does it go? Can't tell. Looks like it curves. Where did it come from? Where did what come from? Muriel asked. Jason and Barry popped to their feet. Why is that freezer pushed away from the wall? She asked, not bothering to wait for the answer to her first question. Jason and Barry looked at one another, each expecting the other to offer an explanation. In their moment of indecision, Muriel stepped forward and peered over the back edge of the freezer. Why is there a hole in our basement wall? She asked. The questions were piling up quickly. We don't know, Jason finally confessed. I think it's how the mice are getting in, Barry asserted. Kind of big for a mouse hole, isn't it? Muriel suggested suspiciously. I didn't say they made it, just that it was how they were gaining ingress. They all stared at the hole. I'm going in, Barry declared. He stepped out from behind the freezer and walked over to the large bag of gear he had brought down into the basement. From it, he dug out a hard hat with a miner's lantern attached to it and a length of rope. He returned to the hole, tied one end of the line around his waist, then handed the other to Jason. Hang on to this. If I give one tug, it means I'm okay. If I give two tugs, that means I found something. If I give three tugs, pull me out as fast as you can. If I give four tugs, where do you think you're going? China? Muriel asked, cutting off the increasingly elaborate instructions. Just shout, we'll hear you. Barry glared at Muriel, then switched on his miner's lantern and dropped to his hands and knees. He stuck his head into the hole, then slowly crawled inside. The rope followed him. Jason picked up the slack so he could feel if Barry gave it any number of tugs. Well, I'll be... Barry's muted voice said from deep within the tunnel. What is it? Jason asked. You guys gotta come in here and see this, he answered. Is it safe? Muriel inquired. Jason didn't wait to hear Barry's reply. He dropped down and scurried into the hole. Jason, Alexander Beauregard, you come out of that hole right now, Muriel ordered. But Jason didn't obey his wife's command. Muriel put her hands on her hips, but the gesture had no effect. So she walked around the freezer and bent over to look into the hole. She could see a flickering light where the tunnel seemed to bend. She stood up, shook her head, then eased herself into the hole and started crawling along the dirty passage. The bend was gentle enough for her to navigate easily. The tunnel then started sloping downward until it opened into a chamber. She entered and stood up to look around. It seemed as if someone lived there. There were small pieces of furniture, those that would fit through the tunnel, along with piles of different items carefully sorted. One stack was various tools, pens and pencils, and small containers. Another was a haphazard pile of books and magazines. 
and a third consisted of clothing and linens. What is this place? Jason asked. Looks like the previous owner made a secret chamber. Maybe it's like one of those panic rooms, Barry speculated. Jason ran a hand over the peculiar grooves along the clay walls of the dome-shaped room. They looked somehow familiar. What are these? he asked. The inquisitive exterminator joined Jason and inspected the odd texture of the wall as he gathered up the rope cinched around his waist and looped it over his shoulders like he'd seen a spelunker do on TV once. Tool marks, he said after a moment. He made this all by hand. No way he could get any heavy equipment in here. Jason nodded thoughtfully, not entirely satisfied by Barry's confident answer. Muriel picked up what looked like a dish towel from the pile of laundry and looked at it carefully. Barry continued his inspection of the room until he noticed another hole in the far end, hidden behind a small end table with an old radio sitting on top of it, its cord dangling uselessly. He moved the table aside and looked into the hole. There appeared to be a light source somewhere inside. The infestation eliminator got back on his hands and knees and crawled inside. Barry, where are you going? There's another tunnel, he shouted. I'm going to see where it leads. Jason and Muriel exchanged a look, then bent over the pier inside the new tunnel, just in time to see Barry's feet disappear around a corner. Jason got on all fours to follow. Where are you going now? Muriel asked. Technically, this is part of the house, Jason reminded her. It's all our property. We should know what we bought. He disappeared into the hole. Muriel rolled her eyes and sighed heavily. She stuffed the dish towel into her back pocket and followed her husband. After she made the first turn that Barry and Jason had disappeared around, she found herself faced with a T-shaped intersection. She looked in both directions, but there was no sign of either of the men. Which way did you go? This, this way. way, both of them replied simultaneously. Right or left? she asked more specifically. Right, Jason answered. Left, Barry responded. Muriel decided to follow Jason and turned right. The tunnel took a series of turns. She wondered why it wasn't completely dark then noticed that at intervals there were those little stick-up lights like they sold on TV pressed into the ceiling at each intersection. They must have been motion activated, otherwise the batteries would be long dead. She paused as she arrived at another junction. It's a maze, she thought to herself, it's just like the ones on the placemats at the Denny's. As if reading her mind, Barry called out from somewhere. It's a maze. Where are you? Jason asked in return. Wait, I'll let the rope trail behind me. When you find it, I'll be on the other end. It would be pointless for Muriel to try to figure out which way Barry and Jason had gone, so she decided to make her way back. She followed the twists and turns as best she could remember, but the way quickly became confused. Finally, she spotted the frayed end of Barry's rope dancing around one corner. She scrambled to catch up with it. When she did, she kneeled on it to keep it from moving. The line became taut. Hey, who's holding my rope? Barry called. I am, Muriel replied. Just sit still a moment so I can catch up. The line went slack, and Muriel started following it until she saw Barry and Jason sitting at an intersection. You know we're lost, don't you? She said scoldingly. Not at all, Barry insisted. I've been making only left turns the whole way. That's the secret to solving any maze. It's science. I don't think that's right, Jason said. Barry ignored him. Follow me. He started crawling down one of the tunnels that branched off from where they were. That's right, Jason pointed out to the determined trapper. Barry paused, then backtracked and went down the opposite tunnel that went left from where they were. After another few minutes, the tunnel started getting wider and taller, until soon they could stand up. We must be under old man Hardigan's house by now, Jason speculated. As they made their way around the next bend, there was what looked like a dead end. Two steel slabs formed a corner. Now what? Muriel asked. Barry shined his light on the panels, then pushed. They seemed to give way. Give me a hand here, Jason, he ordered. Jason put his shoulder to one panel while Barry pressed against the other. They swung open like double doors. These doors remind me of something, Barry muttered, half to himself. But he put the thought out of his mind when he glimpsed what was behind them. Holy moly, Jason uttered. Unbelievable, Barry agreed. What? Muriel asked. She pushed her way past the men and entered the chamber. 
It was a large dome, like the first one they had encountered, and it was filled with money. There were stacks of bills, ones, fives, tens, twenties, even some fifties and hundreds, all loosely stacked in a great mound. Another three-foot-tall pile was loose change, and a third smaller heap was jewelry and other trinkets of silver and gold. We're rich, Jason declared. Muriel smiled in delight. Where did all this come from? The previous owner must have been hoarding it for years, Jason suggested. Can I bring up the notion of a finder's fee? Barry said, ignored by Jason and Muriel. Each of them approached one of the piles and began inspecting the treasure. Muriel was gathering up the higher denomination bills from the mound of paper money when she noticed a framed photograph, its glass smeared with clay. She took out the dish towel she had tucked into her back pocket and wiped it clean, revealing an antique black-and-white portrait of an old man with a long beard. I wonder if this is the man who made all this, she pondered aloud. Then she noticed something about the towel. In one corner was a purple stain she thought she recognized. Muriel had a towel of her own that was identical to this one. That's why she had picked it up. She thought it would be nice to have a matched set. But as she inspected it further... She realized it didn't just look like her towel. It was her towel. Jason, this towel is from my kitchen. So why would you bring it down here? I didn't. It was in that pile of clothing and stuff in the other room. Barry stood up from the stacks of coins he was organizing, trying to get a rough count. He peered back at the doors they had come in through, recognizing what they reminded him of. Jason diverted his attention from the valuables he was sorting to run his fingers over the tool marks etched into the walls. How did my dish towel get into that room? Muriel asked, puzzled. You know what these marks look like? Jason queried, ignoring Muriel's question. Now I remember what those doors remind me of, Barry said, with a snap of his fingers. The two steel panels swung shut. Jason and Muriel went to the doors to look for a way to open them, but there were no handles on the inside and they couldn't get a grip on the seam between them. You'll never get those open, Barry sighed. What are you talking about? Jason asked. It's a trap, he said admiringly, casting his lantern over the walls and ceilings of the chamber. A trap? Muriel asked. I have one like it in my bag, on a smaller scale. The mouse noses his way through the flaps to get at the bait. Then once he's inside, the flap snaps shut, and there's no way for him to get out. There has to be a way out, Jason insisted. Barry's light found another opening in the far wall that swallowed the beam like a black hole. Why? Muriel asked. Who would build a trap like this under our house? Jason once again turned his attention to the grooves on the wall. You know what these remind me of? They look like the tooth marks on the mouse hole behind the kitchen toaster. Barry shined his light on the long divots. Geez, you're right but a mouse would have to be six feet tall to have teeth this big. An eerie, chittering sound emanated from the dark hole. What was that? Muriel asked, clutching Jason's arm. Barry finally put it all together. He laughed in amazement. <laughs> Incredible! It is a trap, just like I would build. What are you talking about? Jason asked. What is that noise? Muriel inquired again. Don't you see? This is the bait, he said, waving at the piles of money. The first chamber was meant to get us curious. The maze steered us to this room, and then the trap was sprung. You mean someone built this to catch people? Muriel asked. Not someone, Barry corrected. Something. What? Jason inquired. Barry picked up a long, thick hair from the ground. I was right. Something did escape from that lab. Something that had spent its life in mazes and traps. Mus Gigantus. Speak English. To put it in layman's terms, I think we've been caught by a giant super mouse. Stop joking, Muriel said. You're scaring me. The chittering grew louder, then stopped. Two huge red eyes glowed out at them from the darkness of the tunnel in the opposite wall. They came closer. A large black nose surrounded by foot-long whiskers, poked cautiously out of the tunnel, followed by the rest of the enormous rodent. Well played, my friend, Barry said to the oversized creature. Well played. The mouse leaped toward them. Barry dropped his flashlight in surprise, 
and the helmet with the miner's lantern fell from his head, plunging the room into total darkness. Muriel screamed. Thank you for listening to Mousetrap, written especially for the Bedtime Stories for Insomniac's fiction podcast by Rich Hosek. Please remember to subscribe on your favorite podcast app and share these stories with anyone who enjoys audiobooks. My latest novel, Afterlife, is available for pre-sale on Kindle. The first book in this paranormal mystery series, Near Death, is free on Kindle January 12th through 16th and available at a reduced price after that. If you're looking for other original story podcasts, check out asreadbyme.com. You can get a free bookmark if you sign up for the email list at bedtimestories.studio where you'll be notified of new episodes and special stories and offers only available to subscribers. Visit richhosick.com to learn more about the host of Bedtime Stories for Insomniacs. Thanks again, and all the very best.